Okay, everyone. Oh, okay. You want to you want to help me with that? Oh, uh. Okay. Great. Right here. Great. For, for assistance for something, so we've just taken care of that real quick. Okay. So last week, we, um, we started in Matthew chapter 13, looking at the soil of our hearts and, and receiving from God uh, the, the words that he gives us, the seed that he plants inside of us, and what we do with those truths and, and those things. And so we're going to pick up with part two of that today. Uh, we got through the first soil and a half, if you will. Um, so we're going to pick up with that today, and really, the more time that I've spent uh, on this section of Scripture, the more that God has spoken to me in it. So I, I pray that what I've been learning will be beneficial for you this morning as we come. We see Jesus here meeting in Matthew chapter 13, verses 3 through 23, with a large crowd of people, including the disciples. So there's disciples and there's a large crowd of people and he gives this incredible teaching um, and he says this, he told them many things in parables saying a farmer went out to sow his seed and as he was scattering the seed some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow but when the sun came up the Plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. Now he's not saying here he who has ears, because we all have ears, right? He's saying, he who is willing, he that is able, he or she that is willing to hear, let them hear. Verse 10, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he has will be taken from him. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Other words, they might, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. So there's quite a picture that God gives us here. This picture that, that not everyone is willing to. Not everyone is willing to receive. Not everyone is willing to see. Not everyone is willing to perceive what God is calling them to or is sharing. You know, and I saw um, a teaching on this a while back where there's this great grace that God gives us that for those that are not willing to receive God's truth, He puts it in parables so they're not, they're not held accountable on Judgment Day for seeing the truth and rejecting it. Isn't that cool of God to do that? It's very, God's very, very merciful even in how He has the Lord Jesus reveal in parables. And then verse 16, He says this. Now again, this is, He's talking about people whose hearts have become callous. They, 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 they reject the truth that is, that is shown. You know, and, and we always have this choice. That's why we ask the Spirit to, to guide us and enlighten us and help us to see and hear. Because there's always a choice to receive what God gives us. Verse 16, But blessed are your eyes because they see, 
and your ears because they hear. For I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom, this is the kingdom of God, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who receives the seed that fell on rocky places is the person who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who received the seed that fell among the thorns is the person who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the person who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding a hundred, sixty, or thirty times. It's a lot. What was sown? Now we're going to drop back to Matthew chapter 6 for three verses here where Jesus is explaining what is important when it comes to worry. He says this for us in verse 31 of Matthew 6. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. That's a great promise we have from God. Seek first his kingdom. And all these things will be given to you as well. Let's pray. Lord, it's a great, great scripture. And I thank you for what you've been teaching me this week. Lord, there is so much for us to learn from this text. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to us and give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear. And grow us in this time, Lord. Grow us in this time in your word. Lead us to a place of more maturity and more fire for you. We ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus here again used a parable that everybody would have understood in that time because everybody back then farmed. It's like using a parable about apps on your smartphone. Is that good? Is that accurate, right? Yeah? A smartphone app parable? Huh? You know, I mean, it's like that. Everybody knew about sowing seed. Even if you weren't a farmer, chances are you planted something at some point. And this picture of throwing seed everywhere which really is what we're called to do in Matthew chapter 28, where we're called to make disciples of all the nations, take all the seed and throw it everywhere. And if you've ever done farming before, you know that when you're getting out there in the field, it's not one seed over here and one seed over there and one seed over there. Farmers take it and go... Or you get one of those machines that goes... You know, like a sprinkler? Have you guys ever seen this before? Right? So the idea is you want to get as much seed everywhere as you can. And so that would have made a lot of sense to them. And then we have this picture of different types of soil where the seed falls. And we talked about this last week, so I'm only going to cover what we did briefly. Um, but but it, it, it's a really strong picture here of the state of the soil determining what happens with the seed. And the control over the soil, good news, it's up to us. Our soil is our responsibility. I saw an illustration. There's a pastor named Steve Dow who, who <laughs> I, I borrowed this from him. Um, but he talked about an old Native American um, Indian chief who was teaching at one point the young braves of the village. And he sat among them and he said to them, inside of you, inside of each of us, there is a war going on inside. And it's like two dogs in a fight. 
One dog always wants to do what is wrong and what is evil. The other dog always wants to do what is right and what is good. And one of the young braves said, but chief, which one wins? To which he replied, the one you feed. Isn't that good? Which dog wins? The one you feed. So what dog, not a real dog, but you know, what, what are we feeding inside of us? What are we feeding? Which way are we going? Am I, am I immersing myself in, in um, you know, uh, I, this is actually not pre-planned, so, you know, we're going to go with, uh, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, sketchy uh, videos, people doing, you know, music and, 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 and uh, sketchy things. Or maybe we're, we're looking at, you know, all the, all the horrible news stuff that's going on. Or we're, or we're feeding ourselves on, on fear or different things. Or we're getting around people and doing lots of gossip or whatever it is. And all that feeds something. Or are we surrounding ourselves with the things of God? Are we spending time in the Word? Are we worshiping? Are, are we, are we um, you know, feeding ourselves on the things of God that point to a better understanding of who God is and how God loves. The one that you feed is the one that wins. I thought it's a great picture. So we've got, we've got these four different kinds of soil, and I, I want to entitle this, How to Cultivate Your Heart for a Spiritual Harvest. Does that sound good? It sounds very appropriate. We could write a book as a church, you know, like, How to Cultivate Your Heart for a Spiritual Harvest. So the first thing we need to see from the first soil is we need to plow the soil. Because that hard soil gets trampled down, and then the seed lands on it, and what happens? It can't grow. You know, there's no, if, if, the, if, the, if the ground is hard and packed in, the seed cannot become into a plant. It can't, it can't foster growth because the, the hard ground rejects whatever it is. So we need to plow the soil. We need to plow up the, the, the hard dirt. We have a... Um, a front yard, it's not very big, but, but uh, when, when I, we had, I had a gardener come in one time because we needed to get rid of some weeds and things. And so he came in, and the first thing he did was he dug up the hard soil in the back by the windows so that we could plant things in it again. It had become hard. It had gotten packed down in. So we, we've got to turn that soil over. We've got to dig it up. We've got to make it so that it's soft. And when we make hard soil into receptive soil, it's a process that we have to go through. And oftentimes that can be painful. Dealing with the hard things, the things that make our hearts hard can be painful. Whether that means um, some kind of healing ministry, deliverance, forgiveness is a big one. Oh, it's so big. We have a, we have a, um, a woman, a couple, in our first service. And um, she came here from another country. And within the first year that she was here, her husband was shot and murdered in front of her. And so for the first year she was in the church, I would sit there in the back, this was back in 2008 or 2009, and she would just cry about how hurt and upset and how unfair it was. And, I, and I, would, I would sit with her and pray with her. And this went on for months. And, and she kept giving it to God and giving it to God and saying, God, this is not the end of my life. And some people will choose to let that, that unfair injury define who they are going forward. And they'll stay hard and angry and bitter. And doesn't life suck? And aren't people mean? Isn't God unfair? And they choose to live there. But this woman, praise God, gave it over to, to the Lord. He, she allowed him to work on her heart. She was still upset, but she began the process of forgiveness of what happened. And she began to look for Enough for God to, to bring a companion back into her life, and she found the most amazing man who's been with us at the church now for seven years. She was an elder. I don't know what the first guy was like. I'm sure he was good, but this guy is extraordinary. I'm serious. And so now this woman, because she didn't give up, she didn't choose anger or bitterness or hatred and allow her heart to remain hard, has found an amazing person and now has a great life honoring God in her life and doing incredible things. She was allowing herself to cultivate the hard path, 
the hard dirt. And there's a process. We need to plow the hard soil to keep our hearts receptive and open to God's truth. The second one is this. We need to put down roots. Oh, man, you guys in L.A., putting down roots is not popular. Anybody? I used to go to, to industry uh, parties, and, man, I love this move. It's like you see somebody, hey, how you doing? Hey, how's it going, man? Good to see you, dude. Hey, what's going on? All right, man, glad you're here. You ever see those ones? You know, <laughs> roots looks like something. You know, we have this, we have this parable of, of, of the, the soil. It's, very, it's on the rocks. And, and the picture that we have here is not like some rocks. It's actually there's so much rock that the soil doesn't go very deep. And so the plants aren't able to get firm roots that go anywhere except for this. And we know from photosynthesis that when water and, and, and uh, the sun come, the plants grow, right? But if there's if the plants aren't strong and don't have much roots, when the sun comes up, when the attacks, when, the, when the, the, um, the challenges of life come up and it gets hot, if we don't have roots, the plant will wither and die. Have you ever seen that before? Those little plants that are like in the, in the cracks of the driveway? You know, if there's not root, they die when the sun comes up, when it gets hot. And I've seen so many Christians, and I think most people in this church have seen this too, where they start off on fire for Jesus, but something happens, and they hate God, they hate church, they hate Christianity, because life got hard, and it, it's got to be God's fault. And it's easy, it's easy to run away and turn away from God when things get hard if we don't have roots in God's Word and God's promises and really, it's also our personal history with God. I can hold on to my history with God when it's in line with the Word. So we're, we're always building a history with God. He's proven himself faithful in this situation. He's done this. I've trusted him, and he's shown up here and there. And all of a sudden, we begin to be aware of all that he's done. It becomes part of our root system, part of our history. You know, we do it in relationships all the time. When, when challenges come, we see who is supportive and who is against us, right? And we can see that God is faithful. And so we hold on to that the next time around. And the next time, and pretty soon, we know that he is always at work for our good. That he's always at work for his purposes in our lives. That he can be trusted. These are all part of our roots in going from Excited to mature. Because really, the hardships and the attacks should only lead us to a stronger place with God if we're mature and if we have good roots. The root system cannot be overstated. I, I told a story last week that I didn't tell in the first service, but that I can tell here about the, about the um, karate master. Do we know this one? Okay, I might tell the story. So um, this is the illustration for, for the roots. There was once a 10-year-old boy who decided to study judo after losing his left arm in a car accident. Okay? Left arm in a car accident. Uh, afterwards, he was crippled, but he said, you know what, I want to learn how to do judo. So he got um, uh, together with an old Japanese judo master. I watched Karate Kid this week, by the way. It's kind of an inspiring movie if you haven't seen that one. It's old now, though. Um, and, and so the, the, sen so the sensei began to work with the boy and he taught him one judo move. It's a lot of moves in judo. He taught him one judo move. And, um, and he worked on this move over and over and over and over and he got really good at it. And as the months went along, he said to his, to his teacher, he said, Sensei, I'm getting really good at this one move. How about some other moves for me to do? And the sensei said, nope, just master the one move. And so he worked, and he worked, and he mastered it. And finally, the sensei said, okay, you're ready for a tournament. So they went to the tournament, and the first two matches he won pretty easily. And he surprised himself. He's not a very big boy. And he's playing with one arm instead of two. And they came to the third match. And um, the boy looked at the, at the person he was up against, and he said, sensei, this, this one's very big. And he said, no, no, just stay focused. Stay true to yourself and remember the move. 
So he waited and waited, and, the, and he was losing, and all of a sudden the guy made a mistake, and he grabbed him, and he pinned him with his one great move. Now he was in the finals of the tournament, faced against uh, another, another former champion. He was overmatched, it looked like, physically in every way. And as the match wore on, the, uh, the referee uh, called a timeout to talk to the sensei and said, I'm going to stop the match, your kid's going to get really hurt. And the sensei said, nope, let him finish. I believe he can still win. So the match resumed, and the bigger, stronger champion made a move, and the young boy grabbed him and pinned him to everyone's amazement. And on the way home, the boy and the sensei reviewed every move of each and every match in the tournament. And finally, the boy summoned the courage to ask what was really on his mind. And he said, Sensei, how did I win the tournament with only one move? And he said, you won for two reasons. First, you've almost mastered one of the most difficult throws in all of judo. And secondly, the only known defense for that move is for the opponent to grab your left arm. Remember, he didn't have one. And when we have strong roots, those things that are our biggest weakness can actually become our greatest strength. God can redeem that which was injury and take it and make it a strength for us. And so when the heat and the trials come our way, if our roots are good, it will only lead us to a place of strength and maturity in God. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 through 2 say this, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms and laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. He's saying we have these great foundational truths, but we've got to go beyond just knowing the facts. We've got to come into a place of maturity. He tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.9, keep hold of the deep truths of your faith. He says to the Ephesians in Ephesians 3.17, be rooted and established in love. Have strong roots in the right things. Shallow Christianity cannot survive in times of trouble. Proverbs 25.2 says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search out a matter is the glory of kings. So we're told that God will conceal things. Why? For us to search it out. I mean, that's actually a promise. It's a promise to us that if we will seek, God will show us. Jeremiah 29, 13 through 14, the first part of 14 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. So here's a, here's, a, here's a truth for us. We can never go too deep with God. You ever have those friends in your life where you're like, man, this person seems cool, but I don't want to know, know too much about them because I might find something I don't like? Anyone ever have those people that, around, you know, that work with baby, you know? They, yes? Not in your home, but, you know, like in the world outside. And, and the reality is that God, you can never go too deep with God. The third soil that we have is the weeds. Remember the weeds? This one is one that I think really is prominent in our modern culture. The weedy soil. And, and he addresses it by name. He says, the thorns represent the cares of this life, the desire for wealth, fame, and personal success, which choke out the word of God and the lives of people. I want to be very clear with you. God is not against you having wealth, success, or fame. In fact, I think he wants us to have those things. He doesn't want those things to be primary focus over the kingdom. You see the difference there? It's a real clear difference. God wants us to be successful. He wants to give us those things, but he wants us to have them in the right perspective. I saw an article in the Wall Street Journal a number of years ago um, they interviewed six of the top executives in the country that all made six-figure salaries between $100,000 and $1 million a year. 
Now, I don't know about you, but if I made six figures, and maybe some of you do, hopefully you do, I would feel like there's no problems, right? But they asked these top executives the same question. They said, what is your greatest fear to these six top executives? And they all had the same response, which was their greatest fear would be that they wouldn't have enough. Their greatest fear was they wouldn't have enough. The follow-up question was, how much is enough? And the answer was always a little more than I have right now. It would seem that the world's goods com never completely satisfy us. You know, work oftentimes becomes the center of our lives. And then everything else, friendships, volunteer service, our walk with Christ, our family needs, everything else has to revolve around that center object. And as I study scripture, I don't think it was intended to be that way. The Lord was intended to be the centerpiece and everything else was to revolve around him as the center. If the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth are choking out our spiritual development, we need to restructure our lives. If, if our desire for wealth and the things of this world are choking out our spiritual development, we need to restructure and redefine our lives. Some, um, so some would say, Pastor, how do we do this? And the first thing that I would say to you is, that we should be tithing. If God doesn't have our pocketbook, then he probably doesn't have our heart either. Tithing is, is an issue for a lot of people that are Christians that's a really hard one. My, um, my first year, I sent a, a letter to the congregation about our stewardship drive and tithing. And a lady wrote me back saying, I will never come to the church again because you asked for money. And there are some that get offended by that. Um, but I see where proclaiming God as God in that aspect of the finances um, reveals where we hold him in the rest of our lives. And I say this to you about the biblical command to tithe. We're called to tithe, get 10% of all that we get. I say that to you as someone who still is not doing that. And I want to very much. Um, but to this point, I've not been able to do that. I say not being able to, I haven't been willing to. Uh, to take that step of faith. But, but I see in this scripture that that's an important part. Like having our, our, our lives lined up in terms of God's model is how we're going to be able to see, receive, and experience the things that he promises. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.